Welcome to the August 1st Beehive Production user call. We have Antoneg, Emil, Andrew, Rebecca, and myself, Michael, and I have some quick announcements and we'll have a demo from Emil. There's lots of exciting stuff going on. So the Open ZFS User and Developer Summit will be open for registration, hopefully Monday. I think the site will go up today, uh, kind of a beta, it's up now. You can take a peek, that of course may change. I know one sponsor has a different logo, those kinds of things. So I hope to see you in October in Portland, Oregon of all places. I will be speaking at Fossey US both today and tomorrow, today on community stuff, tomorrow on FreeBSD on ARM64. We were talking before the recording about all the awesome ARM64 systems Rebecca has, and I'm so grateful for the Thunderbricks you kindly provided me years ago. It now supports Beehive, yes, finally. So uh, related to news, well, if you've been following these calls, uh, Hans has been looking at producing a statement of work for TPM emulation. Thank you, Goran, for porting the payload, but the actual integration with Illumos and FreeBSD needs to happen, and it doesn't look like it will just fall off a tree. So I've set up a BSD fund link on uh, on that site that uh, hopefully some folks will respond to. Fortunately, recent on a recent call, oh, including Andrew's amazing company, uh, there was very positive feedback. So hopefully we can sort of jumpstart that and get Hans going sooner rather than later. And of course he has to help pay for his upcoming wedding. Yeah, too much information. Uh, Rebecca is looking for access to a 1.5 terabyte RAM machine. It sounds like Contronig has that and might have like more in stock. However, if someone is wanting to be awesome, Rebecca could use more RAM for her current machines such that uh, she can continue to do awesome work. Do you have anything to share on that, Rebecca? Uh, nope. Um, oh. I have uh, machines that can take like two, a couple of terabytes, both x86 and ARM. So, yeah. Got it. And we'll worry about details separately, but I am absolutely happy to just throw it on the list as a donation target and say, let's make this happen because looking at your, your EDK2 announcements, you're doing some really good work. Or as we say on these calls, you're doing Rod's work. But I'm bummed. Okay. Uh, Emil, welcome. Little did I know you were at BSD CAN. You are in Waterloo. You are wrapping up your studies. Uh, we didn't sit down and talk about things like Vert IOFS, but you have a presentation ready. I'm so glad mm -hmm. you made it. Do you want to introduce yourself and start screen sharing Thank when you. appropriate? Uh, yeah, happy to be here. So uh, my name is Emil Salaparis. Uh, um, as you said, I'm finishing up my PhD. Uh, I've been working with FreeBSD throughout uh, doing kernel development. And as part of my research, I happened to meet Vert IOFS. And uh, so I made a prototype about it, and uh, I think that uh, it would be useful for me to upstream it. So uh, let me share my screen. Uh, I've made a present. Uh, oh, this will stop screen sharing, by the way. I've, I've just pushed stop. It'll take a sec. There we go. Perfect. So essentially, I, I just made a small presentation, uh, presentation just to make it easier to follow. Uh, so, basic, so basically, the status is that a regular mode is working, uh, pass-through, uh, I am working on it, pass-through mode. Uh, I'll get more into what is that. Uh, essentially, what is needed is for me to clean up the code and upload it as, as a patch. Uh, I mentioned uh, to you last week that I would do it this week. I got a bit preempted, so I hope to be done by Sunday. Uh, the main hurdle for, for getting this up is getting the fuse tests that we already have uh, on in the tree running on Vert.io FS, this would give us a big, you know, a lot of confidence that the system is working as intended. Uh, so before I go on uh, into Vert.io FS itself, I'd like to explain a bit on how it works, uh, just to give an idea on why it looks the way it does. So Vert.io FS essentially is exactly like Fuse, but instead of having a server locally, we have a server remotely. So the way uh, on the host, what, the way that Fuse works is that you have your applications and you have a Fuse file system that you have mounted. When the applications and in general user space touches data in that file system, it generates Fuse events called tickets that are then, instead of handled directly in the kernel, pushed to a Fuse device. This device is read by a server in user space locally that is able to essentially emulate these operations in 
the main data set that it has and that it uses to back the file system up. This allows us to do things, for example, like show expose us file systems, things that are in file systems, or even do things like bind mounts, for example. So VertiFS is basically that, but instead of sending the events through the uh, kernel user space boundary locally, we just send them using the VirtIO protocol to the host where they are unpacked from VirtIO into regular fuse events and handled in the local fuse daemon that they call VirtIO FSD. This can be a regular, uh, it can have all the flexibility of regular fuse. So this is the nice thing about this. It is that VirtIO FS has all the, is, has a very small delta from fuse. This comes with all the performance advantages, the configuration advantages, and the code of use. In fact, we don't need to change almost anything uh, in our tree. Like So in CSFS Fuse, we don't need to add too much code. And anything we add is independent of what is already there. So right. we can be pretty sure we're not going to break anything. Sorry? Nice. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. So essentially, the, uh, the idea that we have, uh, the, the main thing, the main advantage, like in terms of performance and uh, why would we want this, is that we, there is a pass-through option. So refuse come, uh, a Verita UFS comes in two flavors, regular and pass-through. With regular fuse, we do exactly the thing I described before, where we grab the fuse messages locally, wrap them into a Verita.io uh, Verita uh, descriptor, and then push them to the host. This essentially just gives us the flexibility of running Fuse in the host and exposing the host file system in the guest. The main thing that uh, VirtaFS gives us is that there is an additional configuration option in the VirtaIO device that allows us to directly map host data in the guest. This pretty much looks like grabbing uh, in, the, in the host uh, emulation mode, essentially, you know, the equivalent of user space beehive. We grab it, a region in the device memory uh, sorry, in the guest me physical guest memory, and we treat it like a cache. We essentially directly map blocks from files in the host there, and when the guest touches those files, it directly modifies them. There is no caching, and there is no need for data movement. So this is the main advantage. It, al it allows us possibly to have more density because we're not keeping two copies of the data, and it avoids uh, any copying between host and guest. So this is also better uh, gives us better performance huh. now pass through i haven't implemented yet uh, and we might need two bits for it but they are not a, a big issue so first we need the virtual of bits from a version 1.3 of the spec correct me if i'm wrong but i think that the virtual implementation we have right now was initially from 1.1 1.3 added a simple extension for essentially mapping device mapping the regions uh, device, virtual device regions into the guest, and that's what we use for pass through. So it should be a minor enough addition. Another thing that we might need, but I'm not sure. I, I would need to uh, to look into it a bit more. Maybe we need a direct fuse vnode mapping, and by that I mean that fuse in general has the same problem that I just described. We the data that we have in the fuse file system. If I go back here in the mounted FS and the data that we have in the Fuse server are normally discrete. So we, we would like, there is an extension that is in, other, is in Linux, but not FreeBSD, as a, unless I'm mistaken, that allows us to essentially keep one copy of the data between the server and the, uh, and the, file, system, and the file system. So the main, up, uh, by the way, up to now, are there any questions? Uh, because I'd like to go into testing this, which is kind of a, a whole other kind of world. Uh, okay, so if there aren't any questions, yeah, keep it coming. Yeah. So basically, the main so the main problem we have, and uh, this is not just for Virta OFS, is that we need to be able to to, uh, to write some tests for this. Like it's. It is conceptually simple, but we we don't really uh, we would like to essentially make sure that all the fuse tests that we have also run on VirtaIOFS. And since we VirtaIOFS shares most of its code with fuse, then that would give us a high degree of certainty that everything is all right. So 
what uh, the problem with this is that the fuse test suite that we have right now needs to spin up a server and a client for fuse in the same machine because that's how fuse works with virtio this is not the case virtio requires a hypervisor to communicate events between the the guest and the host and normally the fuse server should be on the host and the fuse client and the fuse client and the users of the file system should be in the guest. So the question is, how do we do this? Like essentially, we would either have to re-implement all the all the tests, or we would need to add some VirtiOFS specific hack to be able to redirect Virti uh, the fuse messages back to user space. But that would defeat the purpose of testing the VirtiO interface. So. I think I have like something that is like I have, and this is actually up on review. I have a, a way of call, essentially collocating the device simulation code and the driver in the same machine just for testing purposes, just to make this possible. And I think that this could be useful for other Virtio devices. Like I call it Virtio DBG, it's just a placeholder, it's not an actual Virtio like spec thing. Uh, so Virtio DBG allows us to just put as I mentioned, the user space beehive that we're using to emulate the machine that is normally in the host and the driver that is normally in the guest in the same machine. And this would be useful, not just for VirtIO FS, but in general, if we wanna have tests for VirtIO devices that we wanna run in a CI where nested virtualization is difficult. This would also make orchestrating these tests easier because we're not juggling events across two machines. So the idea for this is to cut the hypervisor out of the VirtIO protocol, right? Like the VirtIO is made so that it communicates events from guest to host somehow, essentially by doing events that can be intercepted by the hypervisor. If we, try, if we are able to avoid this and just bounce the events back to local user space where they can be handled by Beehive, by a local Beehive copy, then we, we are able to run everything in a single box. And this, I think, would be useful for developing both, both Virtio devices in general and will uh, and uh, for testing Virtio device simulation code in Beehive. So the status for this, uh, it's up on Fabricator. Uh, there is already feedback that uh, people have left. I will address them after uploading Virtio FS just to remove the bottleneck from, you know, just to get things going uh, with Virtio FS, which, you know, and get it used. So do you have that review. The handy? idea. Do you have, always have your links. Do you have that review link handy? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. I'll, okay, that'd I'll, be awesome. I'll, when you have a chance. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'll upload it uh, after I'm done. Uh, oh, for sure. Yes, perfect. So the the idea with Virtual DBG, just to give you an idea, because it, the code is a lot and it needs some, uh, but most of it isn't really like uh, part of that. Shouldn't be a really bad part of that diff. I'll explain what I mean. Essentially, the idea is that we replace the, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but replacing the transport of the VirtIO guest driver so that we can test the driver itself. Every VirtIO device driver in essentially has three components. Uh, all, the driver proper, this is what emulates the device like VirtIO BLK, VirtIO Net. Uh, the virtues, which is the VirtIO protocol proper, it's just a bunch of queues that are used to kind of pipe events through to, from the guest to the host and back. And then the transport that essentially gets those high level vert, vert queue events and turns them into something that we can pass through the hypervisor boundary in some way. Uh, so the nice thing is that the host, the host like user space beehive here, the VMM, has the exact same structure. Like there is an emulation code, the vert queue handling itself, and then driver emulation, which is um, each driver is a kind of in its own file, and it is again, for example, you, you know, it reads the uh, for the Virtio BLK driver. We unpack the virtues, we read the the descriptors, and then we interpret them into block driver into block device events. And then we handle that. We send, we notify the guest through the transport emulation protocol and back. So the idea here is, can we just cut the hypervisor out of this process? So what if we are able to, when we generate transport events, just send them somehow, have a local device from which we can propagate them to local user space instead of uh, like instead of to a host. 
And then in the, in the uh, local user space, can we have a transport emulation code that interprets events into that built IODBG device and then you know, turns them back into high-level vertical events and use the driver uh, and like sends them to the driver? Uh, actually, we, we can, and this is the main idea behind this with IODBG. Like the driver, emulation code, and the driver is what we're really using, like in, to actually run the device and uh, and you know what we run in the guest. So as long as the rest of the stack is you know close enough to the real one, which it is, then we can essentially develop drivers and develop the device emulation, and then test them on a box, on on a single box without needing a hypervisor. So the components that I have added is just these three. A uh, custom guest transport. I've used, I've expanded on the existing MMIO protocol transport that uh, Vertio has. This is basically just a simple transport for uh, configurations that, as, as far as I understand, do not support the PCIe transport. So MMIO is very simple, and we can actually almost use it as it is. Like we can only need to overload a couple methods. So the code impact is minimal. Then we need a control device, which is also relatively simple. And we need the, which is the complex part, Beehive MMO device emulation. Uh, we need like a, essentially to be able to interpret the MMIO transport from Beehive. So this is mainly the main source of complexity here, even though it's not really, uh, it's not that big of a deal, I would say, in that it's not, uh, that hard to build. Like essentially, uh, it's mainly a matter of software engineering. Like I, uh, we don't have MMIO in Beehive. It wouldn't make sense to add MMIO support in Beehive, in my opinion, because it seems like there's not many users for it, and it would needlessly require the factoring and you know extra code. So what I've done instead is I've grabbed some like the driver uh, emulation code from Beehive and the virtual logic. Uh, I've removed anything that is unrelated to device emulation. And then I've uh, plugged an MMIO transport underneath so that we are, uh, I'm able to run device simulation locally. Uh, I haven't changed the Beehive uh, device simulation code at all. So uh, there is no, essentially, as long as the transport works, we can do this kind of testing for any device for which we have device simulation code in Beehive. And for VirtIOFS, this is the only thing that is missing in order to kind of go full circle and be able to run the uh, the fuse test for it. Uh, I think this would also be useful for any other Vertio devices. Like if we had, if we built a VSOC driver and then we have VSOC device emulation, we could run uh, VSOC related tests, for example, uh, into a single box, maybe in a CI without needing to spawn a VM. Um, so yeah, that's it. Like uh, any feedback, uh, you know, this is, I haven't seen this anywhere else, so I'm not sure, you know, like if there's any issues with it that I haven't uh, considered. So any feedback is uh, welcome. Thank you so, so much, Emil. I do have, I have a few points and questions, but I'll let mm -hmm. others jump in first. I'll share again. Mm -hmm. So if no one has anything, uh, are you aware of the the simple nine P server that Yakub included, it's simply a make file and a C file. And I think it's currently broken on maybe 14.1 and 15. I tried to build it the other day and had no luck, but mm -hmm. it allows you to have an extremely simple, I believe single threaded nine P server so that, you know, we've been waiting on the, the client until recently, which I've documented mm -hmm. on the Beehive Wiki. Uh, it lets you, exercise that transport on a single host with without bothering your virtualization engineers in the lab or anything. So oh. take a peek at that, how they've done it. Maybe it's an example, mm -hmm. but I totally see how, you know, having a local service and hitting it locally, heck, I, I, you know, I've, mm -hmm. I've tested NFS service from the host just to make sure it's like smoke tested. So uh, there's mm -hmm. one angle on it. I think I found the review. Um, mm -hmm. In all of this, do you, do you think the emulation needs to be more pluggable because uh, occasionally people suggest beehive like pluggable pci devices just support so that each different type of vertio handling etc is just a, some form of a module for lack of a better term i don't know how that would be architected but 
Uh -huh. uh, do you, so, did you see any opportunities in looking at this? Uh, so for this, uh, so this is, uh, I, I didn't really have a problem with PCI plugability because MMIO is completely orthogonal. So okay. I would say that I, I don't really, I don't think it's really Beehive's fault that it's not supporting it because it seems like MMIO is a fallback. Uh, essentially, MMI, Vertio, the Vertio protocol supports three transports. One of them is, I think, S390 specific, so we don't really care. Uh, PCIe and the MMIO. Uh, as long as the MMIO one is, yeah, like I don't think that since there's only two of them and one of them is not used and is, would only be used for uh, debugging VTIO devices, I don't think it would be worth it doing refactoring unless people would want to use it for something else. What were those three uh, and yeah, what categories? Hmm? Did you say S390 or something? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I, yeah I don't think FreeBSD has support from that architecture. So it's not really it's like, uh, you know, it's kind of, I think it was S390. Uh, yeah. The, yeah, yeah, like yeah. it's an IBM, like way back. Yeah, it's yeah. not really like uh, you know, since there is no support for it anyway. Like, yeah, no kidding. What were the other two? That like, so really... Yeah, and, and PCIe and, and MMIO, like PCIe is well supported, and MMIO is not really used. So ah. I don't think it would be worth a code churn, basically. Got it. Interesting. I um, do have a prototype if anybody's interested. Like it, it works with MMIO. Uh, ah. Like I didn't need to build it. Are there other things that use the examples? Because that whole MMIO in the, in the hypervisor context is new to me. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other examples of that doing things? Oh, uh, not really. Like the MMIO, uh, MMIO in terms of, I, like I think they call it that because instead of essentially triggering PCI events, they uh, use memory, they use doorbell registers to kind of notify the host of events that are of Vertio events. That's where the name comes from. Hmm. So when you're ready, like for, uh, for, you know, for the, for the host to read the Vertio view, you write to a specific location. Got it. Mm -hmm. I've dropped a name in the chat. Uh, I, if, okay. I don't know if mm -hmm. they've been active on Vertio lately, mm -hmm. but uh, Brian did lots of early, you know, that sort of one, uh, one era work, but who knows, maybe, Brian's freed up enough to revisit later protocol levels. So for what it's worth, mm -hmm. uh, I totally invite you to reach out to him. I haven't seen him in years at events, but hey, great. Guy. Yeah, he, he was in the original, like uh, like in the original email thread, we were discussing Vertio FS. Uh, I haven't really pinged him back about with the, the debugging, like Got this, it. you know, the, the transport issues. So uh, maybe, yeah, I will let him know if he's cool. interested. Um, does anyone else have questions or ideas for Emil? And welcome, Daniel. Well, thank you. That is exciting, especially if you might uh, bless us with something new on Monday. So uh, I encourage everyone to take a look at the review. And I'm excited. Uh, so between that and the whole potential for like free BSD on WSL weasel as a client is pretty exciting because they've been ping ponging between between like 9p vert IOFS and block devices so hopefully that dust is settled and you've got the answer anyway um let's see Daniel do you have anything having just rolled in uh, just COVID at the moment just COVID that's been uh, going around quite a bit. I'm kind of nervous about today's conference. Well, I hope okay. you feel better. Um, I'm fine. My main symptom right now is uh, is grouchiness, but uh, I'm still uh, doing a little work. It resulted in some code, didn't it? What was what were you <laughs> sharing the other day? What did I do? Uh, that was that was more jelly. No, I guess it, I guess it's VM related. All related. It's all right. Um, yeah, I got it. Took a BGP uh, um, All right. sub sub network from my data center, and I got it into uh, into my home. So I have a BGP routed via WireGuard from my data center into into my home, which is which is pretty fun. I mean, it's not it's not such an ex it's not really such an exciting, difficult thing to do. It's just 
realizing that now that I have um, <clears throat> 65,000 networks of uh, 65,000 devices that are all that all have public IPs. Uh, yeah, you can turn any internal network into a public IP6 network with WireGuard and a little elbow grease and a little PF. Um, Does that mean there's a blog post in your future? Bedridden and figure, all? Yeah, I have to figure out where to where to where to put that. I mean, it's just like a it's it's just sort of a you know, a slight twist to what we all do with WireGuard, which I, I imagine all of us do with WireGuard now to link data centers together and so on. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'd love to write about it. We just have um, to figure out where to write about it. Well, to that point, uh, Daniel and I had a chat earlier this week about, okay, if a company is going to kindly throw some documentation over the wall and possibly even nurture it further, where should it go? Is there any notion of like integration documentation in the FreeBSD wiki? A lot of it's FreeBSD specific. Sometimes it's completely cross-platform. Sometimes it's maybe not, but specific. But I'm all ears for ideas on where that documentation should live. I sure like malleable docs like we're using at this moment, even though it's not very open source that I... being worked on. Go ahead, Andrew. <laughs> Well, I think the problem is you've got two questions there. Where should FreeBSD-specific documentation go? And where should cross-platform documentation go? I'm, I'm not sure that's the same question. Correct. I mean, it could be, but... Let's just flip it over. It's vendor documentation. Uh, how do we get that when the... out? Side, to the outside world when the vendor is not trying to just do blog posts for marketing purpose. They're a little more enlightened than that. And they're actually just trying to help people out. So uh, what has your company done in the past, if anything? Right. I was thinking about doing blog posts for, for business writing. And then I'd have like a secret blog for, you know, sort of in a, in a uh, more casual voice for, for my tech writing. Um, but then I was thinking about it and it's like, do I really want to curate another, another blog? Like I do that enough for my clients. Um, so I, you know, I, I would be available to write for, you know, some other place where it's going to, you know, preferably, uh, tangent, you know, linked in some way to, to, to the wiki. So it's sort of open source, something that, that could then be ingested by wiki documents or something like that. I mean, sort of like, I, I guess there's like, like Dan's blog, Dan Langell's blog, it's, he does sort of experiments and I kind of do something like that, except I'm, I try to, I try to find like the least number of lines, like the least amount of code, um, uh, the, the simplest way to perform something. And then the next step for that is, is basically just a, you know, simple wiki documentation here's how to get you know here's how to get this bi feature working well um i don't know yeah yeah i guess i guess it's i guess it's just a tough question that everybody has i would um, i was thinking of just putting my stuff on the freebsd wiki in slash daniel bell slash ideas or something <laughs> And then some of those, some bits of those articles could become actual, actual articles if they're, you know, clear enough and specific enough. Uh, Andrew, has your company thrown any documentation over the wall? Um, kind of, most of our stuff ends up being, at least I'm afraid, is kind of OS specific. That's okay. I... And the question of where do we put that? Is has come up um, right now. It would consist of forking the uh, OmniOS page and then writing a section. And I'm going to be brutally honest here: the OmniOS page is really kind of painful in organization. So yeah, free, FreeBSD also. And I think <clears throat> I don't know. I think there's there is a there's got to be a way to collaborate. Like everybody's. I mean. I don't know. A lot of FreeBSD enthusiasts are on Discord right now. 
And there needs to be something that easy to write documentation in. And I, I can guarantee it's not the uh, Moin Moin FreeBSD wiki. And, you know, people aren't going to, aren't going to, you know, jump in and throw, throw a couple lines of code to make an improvement on there. So, you know, the FreeBSD wiki really isn't a living document at this point. Um, now, and maybe, maybe the, maybe the, you know, sort of the, the midterm answer is that needs to be more accessible. Maybe that's a, uh, you know, it's an accessibility problem. We ha we're we using some ancient stuff for some reason. And, you know, there just, there, there needs to be some outreach to, to get somebody into a system that's a better incubator for these ideas. Because I think probably every single one of us on this call have solved beehive problems <laughs> and have had to go through the same learning process because, you know, picking oh, yeah. together, like I've, I've cut cut out different pieces of the VM beehive wiki, which is really useful for certain things. And the FreeBSD wiki has some beehive stuff that's that's really good um, in in one long document. But it's but it's kind of hard to to, you know especially to find you know what what how do i how do i get windows 11 working in 2024 right now like um, you know that 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 requires like a couple that requires a little searching i just want to add that the problem is not the idea of a wiki itself but like our wiki is the problem like mm -hmm. if you go right. to like the gentle wiki or arch wiki arch they also, yeah, was... well, yeah they're also wikis but the the way that it functions is like developers have their own segment and uh, operators and users have their own segment kind of right the content is a bit different there the way of the content is a bit different although it's still a wiki i think that if you want an example of best case for using a wiki for documentation the arch wiki is it there's really is fantastic Absolutely. for linux and Absolutely. even outside of linux sometimes their documentation oh, yeah. is pretty good oh, xfc questions for your operating system of choice like well go there <laughs> or fuse or whatever um professor emil a uh, phd candidate soon to be a professor do you have any documentation wisdom you can share from academia uh, i'm sure you're uh, kind of <laughs> honestly, like in academia, I think the situation is kind of worse. Uh, but I think that, that is your your worse. audio just went south. Maybe your okay. USB oh. rooting or something. I've seen, heard that. Can, you. can you hear me? Uh, you, we can hear you, but you're a robot. Oh, oops. Uh, sorry, give me a second. No worries. It was a computer involved, uh, probably. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, how about now? Better already. Much better. Thank you. You Perfect. were saying... Okay. So, I was uh, saying that in, ac in academia, a lot of the time, it's... it's uh, is, is it still bad? Sorry. No, it's great. No, I'm, you said... Oh, okay. so, 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 just <laughs> making sure. <laughs> so, no, I was, I was going to say like that in academia, normally, uh, it's uh, the situation is kind of even worse uh, because they, a lot of the code is for prototyping purposes, and it is uh, a lot of the information is spread across the paper and the uh, code. And sometimes, since the code is not really made for a lot of users, uh, it is really made for the person that built it, uh, a lot of it is just directly reading the code. Uh, so, yeah, if anything, I think that academia maybe could learn from, uh, <laughs> from wow. actually, you know, like projects, yeah. Uh, yeah, learn I'm from sure. the FreeBSD wiki. That's a that's a yeah. statement I didn't hear coming. <laughs> so I mean, one thing we could do is we could we could become, um, you know, we could we could become bandits. And um, we, it looks like it looks like uh, Jim Salter is sitting on uh, FreeBSDWiki.net, um, and it says right on the front page that he's willing to hand it over to uh, some trusted people. Uh, so we could just stay stand up. Uh, so Arch Arch is it looks like it's just Media Wiki. So the, hmm. you know it's a modern version of Media Wiki, and people seem yep. to be using it and keeping it up to date. And it's easy for people. It must be easy for people to 
add to because we were talking about things that are OS specific and not. I've got to say, I've used Dark Linux Wiki for a million previous D things. Yeah, heck yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think I think lowering the barrier to entry is. Uh, I mean, I I I would imagine that's number one job. Uh, what welcome. About, Go ahead. Oh, also, what about docs. Um, FreeBSD. Uh, dot org. Hello. That's the thing. So, well, yeah. I mean, there's a bunch of articles there, and there's oh, there's okay. that's where the talks and uh, stuff like that are stored. Can there Was be like a, a an also? article? And can there be an article incubator for? sort of not the journal, like a couple steps mm -hmm. below the journal where we can get some, um, you know, uh, I don't know, community voices for lack of a better word. Sure. That's, uh, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, for, for, from our perspective, when we were configuring LDAP, uh, we were like, oh, there's an article on configuring LDAP with FreeBSD and uh, only one line was outdated. Everything else per worked perfectly fine, and that was last updated two years ago. So uh, that that article's uh, pages in in docs.freebies.org is very useful. I, I feel like it, it's it's yeah. it's a situation where like um, information is so much stable in the wiki that it needs to become an article, right? Like okay, now we have the best practice. Let's turn it into an article, but it's not uh, widely used enough, such as LDAP, that it needs to be in the handbook, right? It's like for niche group of people. You, you, you see what I mean? Uh, yeah. th that could make it like a whole process by itself. And I see a lot of things that way, like configuring a scalable NFS, not a wiki thing, or it, although it can start there, um, not a handbook thing, because it's uh, the, in the handbook, it's like to start the NFS, not scale it, but it could right. be an article. So, so that's that's what I'm thinking. Mm, and then NFS and Vert IOFS permissions and ACLs and fun. That's like an integration thing that who knows where the heck that goes. On the flip side, though, is there? I mean, is there a reason not to put those types of articles as part of a wiki? I mean, a wiki is nothing special. It's just a way of conveniently publishing stuff on a website. Hmm. Yeah, it's just it's just the FreeBSD one is really not comfortable. But yeah, I mean, I'm not. I'm yeah. not some wikis yeah, are better than others. My my point is, it's just it it is just a way of publishing something to the web. Yeah. Cool. Uh Welcome, Mastery Oda, if I got that right. Uh, are, are you just listening in, or do you have any questions or suggestions or ideas? I'm just uh, listening in and just enjoying the experience. Uh, trying cool. to understand and get my footing of what's going on. Um, and if I can help, help as much as I can. That's where I'm at. Uh, are you the one who found this via Discord? Yes. Welcome. Can, we just touched on that. I don't know if you caught that part of the conversation. I'll highlight it in the doc. Uh, can you tell us more about that experience of like, is that just generational? Is it easier to use than say a clunky old wiki? It just what what's the value proposition there that we old farts might not understand? Well, I'm speaking for myself. <laughs> um, well, I, I haven't really gone now. <laughs> As a no. young person, I mean. <laughs> Um, what I would say is um, when it comes to the younger uh, generation, they're looking for something that's impactful that they'll be able to absorb easily. And absorption of knowledge mustn't be constrained. And in their eyes, if there's constraint, they find it difficult. And difficulty then brings them to the point of not having that um, enthusiasm to have the absorption of the information. And that's what I've seen so far. So something that has the impact to want to continue to want to grow and to want to extend the knowledge. And that's where I see it from that aspect, I would say. So wow. McCusick's next book of design and implementation should be like a TikTok. I love the idea. Um, uh, <laughs> I, 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 <laughs> um, not, don't go too far, but go far enough where it's, it's the stimulus 
maintains the concentration within the individual's uh, learning ability. That's where I would I would project the the uh, approach. <laughs> uh, the stimulus. What's your learning ability? It's it's like um, whenever there's, there's engagement of information and absorption, yeah. um, people or, or the youth are looking for. Um, it's like the niche where there there's a hook that gets pulled in with the information. So when I observe it, it's like going on a train track where you enjoy the, the absorption of what you're reading and you're engaging with, where there's a background and understanding of why you're doing what you're doing so that you are stimulated and brought into the enthusiasm of wanting to do what you want to do in the absorption of the information, as one could put it. Um, like a TikTok, TikTok creates that, that, like, that, um, that pull on a continuous basis where a person continues to scroll all the time. Um, we're looking, I'd say, look for something that's a little more subtle where we stimulate in the right way and not the wrong way because we don't want addiction. We want stimulation for growth and we don't want to be it. It's, it's like going towards the addiction phase is it's not going to be very good. Um, how can one place it? Don't lose control in that sense, I'd say. I don't know. Maybe it's just an idea that I'm putting out there. That's beautiful. Cool. Has this been formulated elsewhere, either in your um, blogs, your TikToks, or some academic paper or somewhere? Because you are just opening my eyes to this. Well, this um, is, no, is it, this... It's, de <laughs> it's, design, it's design fundamentals, right? So my, yes. my, my wife is a, is a content strategist, and you know, there, there are books all over, the, all over the house about this stuff. And <laughs> You know, when I go to the FreeBSD wiki and I am logged in by default and then I click on something because I'm like, oh, goodness, these this code would be so useful to paste into my computer. And then I click on the page and then it turns into uh, plain text in edit mode because I've clicked yeah. <laughs> any any random quickly, spot on the page. Quickly, this is yeah. this this is clearly not meant for a human. <laughs> this is, <laughs> it's it's not a it's not a welcoming. It's not a welcoming environment. Um, you know, and no, no shade to the Moin Moin folks. I'm sure that they were designing, uh, you know, rapid editing, uh, documentation system, and maybe there's an implementation problem there. Um, but I don't, I don't see getting people from Discord to, uh, to post and edit their ideas onto the FreeBSD wiki. I think there's, there are too many layers of, uh, you know, ex exactly that kind of, uh, discomfort. Wow. Uh, that, that impedance mismatch. Yeah, that's the term I've heard. What what's it? What mismatch? Impedance mis yeah. mismatch. Wow. That's great. Yeah. You're, you're having to work in different oh. ways. That yeah. transition has always got a risk of losing someone. Well, it was very interesting when they added to the uh, FreeBSD Discord, uh, I don't know, about a month ago, I guess. They they just added, in, in the same format as a regular conversation, there's now a forum mode. So if something needs to be sort of asynchronous and it's a, it's a you know, it's a concept in a jar, like it's it's one concept that needs to be discussed, you can use Discord just to pop in a, a forum post. Now, I'm not suggesting that you also use Discord to you know, document something, but but the point is that you know that, that that's now yet another friendly way that somebody could get uh, some assistance from the community or just collaboration with the community. That's that's and pretty also, powerful. I I mean I, I have noticed this again. No no offense if if anyone takes it on them, but like there's clearly a path if you want the most advanced stuff, like very advanced stuff. It's IRC and mailing list. If yeah. you're doing the day-to-day -day stuff, it's like Discord and the forums. You, you see what I mean? Um, and of course, that also has some uh, closeness to the accessibility, right? The, 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 the earliest users are beginners. They go with the beginner's path, which is fine, I, I think, with like Discord and the forums. And then more advanced users, you're, you're having longer conversations or more intense conversations. So it goes into mailing lists and IRC. Well, I think, um, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, I think oh. that it's more of 
an age thing. I mean, when I started using the internet, IRC was, if you wanted to do real-time com- uh, communication, that was it. That's what you used. Yeah, you know, then, then, then we advanced through some of these other things that are easier to use. But, you know, a lot of us that remember back to those days still use the old things because they still get the job done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, definitely. And, and, and I mean, I think Discord does have its problems. I mean, it kind of sucks that it's, uh, you know, that, that it's closed and you can't run your own, you know, you run your own quote unquote server, but that's really their server. Um, and that, that's a, that's a bummer, but also, you know, you do have to go where the people are going to be at some point. This is fantastic. This has been some of the best content and most timely, efficient content I've seen. This generation extra needs to go give a talk at Fosse. I will step away. Antrenig, you're recording and hosting. Uh, I thank you all. Anything for me before I disappear? I think we can close the call if no one has anything else. Well, any other beehive stuff? Because it is a beehive call. Uh, I will be talking about ARM Beehive tomorrow. I don't know if it's streamed. There, I said it. Thanks. Yay. I'll let you know what I find. And uh, thank you, Antrenig. Thank you, Emil. Thank you, thank you. Mastery Oda, if I pronounce it. <laughs> thank you. No. <laughs> thank you. Thank I, you. Don't be a stranger. I really would like to hear more about this of how we can better engage because, yeah, we're. A lot of us are just on autopilot. These calls are autopilot if, you, if it's not obvious and it's sustainable. And that comes up in my talk in a few hours. So it's all good. Thank you so much. Well, um, I mean, I'm Sandra. hoping that the thing that we're doing over the uh, in October, being in person will help us maybe get some things out of autopilot. Oh, I'm not saying autopilot is bad. It's sustainable. So uh, for those who arrive but late, uh, the, it is and it's the not. Opens EFS uh, Developer Summit and User Summit, very first ever, should be uh, uh, well, well, should be announced like later today, and hopefully registration Monday. And I have already talked to my management, who said, "Yes, we think this is a good idea for you to go." Sweet. Well, be like Andrew's management. Uh, I gotta go. Thank you, everyone. This has been truly thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.